It is the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. West Coast. West Coast. West Coast. West Coast. Welcome to Wise Guys. These guys know sports on this Wednesday, September the 9th on the Wise Guys Show on the Worldwide Sports Network with my co-host, Mr. Clarence Nick. What's up, Clarence? Man, what's going on, Trey? It's been a long two days, man. How you been? Doing pretty well, man. Everybody, remember to go follow Wise Guys on Twitter at WiseGuys underscore eight. Also on Facebook, Wise Guys. And we should have followed Wise Guys on Instagram with these guys know sports. It's hump day. Clarence, how is your hump day? treating you this at this evening it's been treating me well though you know i went to the grocery store this morning got some stuff i'm about to cook up tonight and you know i'm getting pumped up for this show tonight and i couldn't forget definitely couldn't forget about the show tonight man i'm just ready i'm pumped up Trey. what about you? i'm pumped up too i'm pumped up too but real quick before we get into our topics for the day i want to send a happy birthday shout out to my late grandmother grandma willa her birthday was today she would have been 91 years old so i want to send her a happy birthday shout out um, Clarence to my late grandmother, man. I had to make sure I shouted her out on the show before we get started. Is y'all doing anything for tonight, or are y'all already did something? Oh yeah, me and my dad earlier. We 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 you know went to the to the cemetery earlier, and we you know uh, it was tough, but you know I still I'm just I'm I was glad that my grandmother got to live a long life, and she got to accomplish many things in her life. But like I said, I just wanted to send, send her a happy birthday shout out. It wouldn't be right starting the show without sending a, a birthday shout out to my grandmother, man. She taught me so many things, raised me when I was growing up, taught, you know, you know, got me ready for school every day. Like, I just, I can't, I can't thank her enough, man, but you yeah. know, I just had to make sure I shouted her out before we got started today. Yeah. But everybody, we got an action jam pack show ahead. We got our NFL predictions for the AFC. We're going to break down each division and give you our prediction to win each division. We're going to talk about all of the teams in the AFC. We're excited about it. We're going to get into the NFL here in a bit. We're also going to preview tomorrow's night's opening matchup, you know, between the Houston Texans and the Kansas City Chiefs. So we're going to talk about that here in a bit. And real quick, before we get into our topics for the day, I want to give everybody a live score update. Right now, in game six of the NBA playoffs in the Eastern Conference, the Boston Celtics lead the Toronto Raptors 52 the 51. Remember, me and Clarence both had the Celtics in six. They're trying to send home the reigning NBA champions tonight. It's going on live on NBA ESPN. But right now, you're with the Wise Guys crew on the Worldwide Sports Network, Clarence. And let's start off in this yeah. As you got a lot of explaining to do, my friend. <laughs> Yesterday, the Miami Heat beat the Milwaukee Bucks 103 to 94. And they won their best, they won their best of seven series, four games to one. Over the Milwaukee Bucks, Jimmy Butler had 17 points, 10 rebounds, 6 assists. Dragic contributed 17 points. Middleton had 23 for the Bucks. Brent and Lopez had 15 points. So, Clarence, as we open up the show today, you got a lot of explaining to do, my friend. So, I'm going to give you the floor, and I'm going to let you explain what happened to Giannis and your Milwaukee Bucks. Man, I think... First of all, I want to congratulate uh, the Miami Heat to advance and they beat in the number one seed a team in the NBA, the Milwaukee Bucks. And believe it or not, they the uh, I think they are a fifth or sixth seed. That's the lowest seed that ever made it to the Eastern Conference Finals since 1999. So I'm a big shout out to them. So I'm gonna get to the Bucks, man. We get to the Bucks. I've been saying this all week long, man. I I blame Mike Bullhoser. Like I blame him. Look. I'm finally here on Wise Guys, and I'm about to explain why I blame Mike Bullhose. Because one, you knew, you know his his, his life, or you know his, his his weakness. His weakness is not shooting the ball and not having enough skills to score. And you know everybody be so used to him dunking on everybody. So that's that's an obvious thing what he needs to work on. And 
And it was another thing, too. I feel like he didn't put the better team around Giannis, Giannis. And Miami had the advantage in this series because they had depth at, at, on the team that can come in and sub to in and out. Yeah, a lot of young guns. Like, you seen Tyler Hero. Tyler Hero came in and did his thing. You had – uh um, you had Duncan Robinson shooting the ball terrific. Jimmy Butler was amazing, amazing leader on his team, and he took over. He was better than Giannis in this series, and Giannis they crashed because they didn't have no answer for the Miami Heat fast paced ball and shooting. And look, I know you want to laugh and stuff, you want to get started, but I just want to be honest though. He Giannis he, he he didn't show up in the when it was needed, and Chris Middleton he had. He had an okay game, okay series, okay performance in this series. But for Giannis, he didn't show up, and Miami, they was the better team in this series. I'm devastated. Okay. I'm hurt. Now, let, let, let me be the first to let you know, Clint, right here on Wise Guy Sports. I got to let you know, bro, and tell you this. I told you so. I told you this. I told you all season long. The Milwaukee Bucks are pretenders, not contenders. You tried to tell me and everyone else that the Milwaukee Bucks were this title contender, and I told you all year long it was not going to happen. And I told you that they were probably going to lose if they ended up facing the Miami Heat, and it happened in the second round. It was the worst matchup possible for your Milwaukee Bucks. But before I even get into what, what happened, and before I, I get into the reasons why I told you they were pretenders instead of title contenders, I got a question for you. Since when did you become a Milwaukee Bucks fan all of a sudden? All right, so first of all, I am, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to say this on Wise Guys, too. I am a Giannis fan. I'm a big Giannis fan because I like the way how he impacts the game, his gameplay to the game, to the, to the NBA. And he's one of the top players in the NBA. I like, honestly. Now you a Giannis fan. I know you like Giannis, but, hey, bro, you've talked yourself into actually believing that Chris Milton is a top 10 player in the NBA at times. You told me earlier this year while they were in the bubble that Chris Middleton is a top 10 player in the NBA, my friend, and he is not. Chris Middleton is a terrible second option. He probably will be a good third option, but wow. he's not a great second option at all. Okay, let's get that out the way. Chris Middleton, I love you. I think you can play. Yesterday, he had 23 points for the Milwaukee Bucks. He played well in game four, especially. He played very well in game four, and he helped them get this series to a game five. He played very well in game four. I'll give you credit for that. But he is not a number two option on a championship contender, Clarence. He is a good third option, maybe, like a Chris Bosh, like a Clay Thompson with the Kevin Durant-led Warriors. Maybe that's a role for Chris Middleton. But he is not a Kyrie Irving. He is not a Dwayne Wade. He is not a Steph Curry to a Kevin Durant. That is not Chris Middleton. That's not the kind of player he is. Now, let me get to the Milwaukee Bucks. The Miami Heat, they outplayed the Milwaukee Bucks. And at times, Clarence, they seemed like they were toying with the Bucks. They was playing with the Bucks out there. Like, did you watch game four? In game four, once Giannis went out, the Miami Heat, they were doing behind-the-back passes. They were sloppy with the basketball. Even in, game, even in game five, they had over 20 turnovers. They didn't even take the Milwaukee Bucks serious. Man, I was watching the game, and I said, oh, my God, this is bad for my co-host, Mr. Clarence Nixon, because he's going to have a lot of explaining to do. I do. I do. Listen, listen, I, feel listen like I, hold on. I got you. I got you. I got you. I believe, in my opinion, it should have been a clean sweep. It should have been a clean sweep, but Miami, they took their foot off the gas pedal once Giannis got injured in game four. You know I'm right. They really should have swept the Milwaukee Bucks, honestly. They should have no, swept them. And no, then, but real quick, you brought up Mike Budenholzer. I think Mike Budenholzer is one of the best coaches we have in the NBA. But Mike Budenholzer made some questionable decisions in this series. And for some reason, in game two and game three, he had Giannis playing under 40 minutes. Giannis is only 25 years old. Why is Giannis not playing over 40 minutes in a significant playoff game? Like, you're getting outplayed by the Miami Heat. The Miami Heat have a balanced attack. They're coming at you with Jimmy Butler, 
Bam, Dragic, Tyler Hero, Duncan Robinson, Olenek. They got so many players that can create their own shot and score the basketball. You need your star player on the floor to offset any run the Miami Heat throw in your direction. And for some reason, Budaholzer, he was playing Giannis under 40 minutes. It made no sense. But overall, are who you thought they were. And they are pretenders, not title contenders, like you thought, my friend. You got some explaining to do on this. You still got the floor, but, but you did prove my point, though. Look. You, but both with Mike Budenholzer, he only played him. He only played him like 30, 35 minutes, and they was asking him, "How come he, he, you playing Giannis under under forty minutes?" And he just gave him a blunt response, like, "Like this is a team distributor. I, I don't care what what it was, but like you said, this is this was a crucial playoff, a crucial playoff moment for the Milwaukee Bucks that they should have executed." They couldn't execute for the simple fact that Mike Bullholder, he wanted to run a tight system in there. In this type of situation, you have to run, you have to play your best players in crucial time. And I think that he didn't do a good job in that trade. And I'm, I'm devastated because Milwaukee Bucks are fucking out. Yeah. They had no favorite win no. this year. So it was ridiculous. Yeah. It, it, but let me explain it to you. First of all, Eric Blesso, he's been terrible since he's been a member of the Milwaukee Bucks. These last two years in the playoffs, Eric Bledsoe's been god-awful. Like, this is not the Eric Bledsoe that played in Phoenix. When he was in Phoenix, he was nice. For some reason, he hasn't played well with the Milwaukee Bucks in the last two playoff series that the Bucks have lost. Last year against Kawhi and the Raptors, and this year against Jimmy Butler and the Miami Heat. For whatever reason, Bledsoe has played terrible. He's been god-awful for the Milwaukee Bucks. He's supposed to be that third reliable scoring option behind Chris Middleton and Giannis. He hasn't been that, Clarence. He's been anything but that, and he's really been a liability for the Milwaukee Bucks. Again, Chris Middleton, he's not a legitimate second option on championship contender. He may be a good third option, but he's not a second option. And I think he got exposed in this series. Now, when I get to Giannis, I want to tell you something right now. I don't ever want to hear you say that Giannis is better than Kevin Durant, LeBron James, or Kawhi Leonard. Don't you ever fix your mouth to say again that he's better than LeBron, KD, or Kawhi. Don't do it because he's not better than any of those three players I just named. None of them. None of them. You <laughs> wouldn't have said that, though, Trey. Come on now, man. Don't, don't put the you heat said, too much heat on me. What, what you I said that, that he was better than – you said he was better – you ain't never said he was better than Kevin Durant. You said he was the best player on the planet. Don't ever say what? he's the best player on the planet. You did. You he said that. Look. That's going to be safe for another guy. Don't ever, hold on, real quick. Don't you ever say again that Giannis is the best player on the planet until he can learn how to hit consistent jump shots. And game three, I think it was game three, he shot 7 of 21 from the floor overall. He shot 0 of 7 from three-point range. That is the difference in a player like Giannis compared to a Kevin Durant or a Kawhi Leonard or a LeBron James. When you take away their greatest strength, they can also go to – their next greatest so, offensive move, and they can hit perimeter shots. That's what Giannis can't do. That's why Giannis is not, in my opinion, a superstar just yet. Are you you ridiculous? He is he is definitely a superstar. Let me tell you that he's he's young. He's very young. He's only twenty five years old, Trey. He's twenty five. You he's he's still and it's he's still walking into his prime. He's not definitely in his prime yet. But once he develops the jump shot. It's going to get ridiculous. It's, it's going to be ridiculous. And think about it. Think about it. What if he dis- decided not decided to opt out, even though he, he, he said today he don't want to, he's not getting traded. He's staying in Milwaukee. But what if he got traded to go to state, to go to state warriors, a team that's that rely on the three and, and, and passing the ball. Like, think about that. Like that's, that's going to be something huge. Let me ask you a question. Are you sure? Are you sure you can win a championship with Giannis being your number one option? I believe so. I think I think the the uh, the uh, the holes in the holes in that Milwaukee's organization was they didn't have they didn't have a balanced team. They thought they had a balanced team with, with Eric Bledsoe running point, but he wasn't he wasn't effective none none in his playoffs. I mean, his game five he was two for twelve of overall shooting, so he wasn't. 
he wasn't facilitating and scoring as they want him to. That's why when I've been saying, like, when they got rid of Malcolm Brogdon, it, it hurt the team. It hurt the team because he was the point guard that balanced out the team. He can facilitate and score. And Giannis, he, he was actually can play his true position because he had another ball handler on the team. And I heard rumors today that they can be involved with Chris Paul. Now, if they get a point guard like Chris Paul, you can see much, much improvement from Giannis. He much, much in getting his game involved in shooting the ball and creating him a post move that is it's, it's gonna change the league. I'm telling you, it, raw young young superstars are going are riding the wave of Giannis. They coming in as a raw prospect, but they're working their way up. Now that is something that he's starting a new wave. He's bringing it right back. A seven footer bringing the ball up, making score and play defense on both sides. What what else he got to work on? Yes, he got to work on his shooting. Okay. You know, you know what I think Giannis needs? You know what I think he needs? First of all, I don't see his jump shot ever really improving. I'm just going to be completely honest with you. I don't see him being able to hit consistent perimeter shots like a Kevin Durant, like a Kawhi Leonard, like a LeBron James. Who are you comparing him to? But, but that's, we compare him to some of the greatest players in the world. We're, we're comparing to their shooting. We're, we're, in this type of argument, we're comparing to their shooting. You, you, right, you, but listen to what I'm you, saying. Compare. In the playoffs, in the playoffs, teams take away your greatest strength. If you take away his greatest strength, which is, you know, basically finishing around the rim in the paint area, what can he do to offset you taking away what he does best? Look, I agree with you. I agree with you, but he has to. Standard, he has to be able to hit a consistent jump shot. Look, the standard you put, in Giannis, that you want his shooting ability to be to KD's KD's uh, standards or. I can say at least LeBron's because even Kawhi's. I like if you really want to, if you really want to think about it, who is the better shooter between Kawhi or LeBron? Like that, that can be a good, that can be a good argument. But you're putting him to the stand of KD, man. Come on, man. What, what I'm like, saying is, I don't expect him to be able to hit perimeter shots like Kevin Durant. He can't, he can't throw the ball in the, uh, he can't sniff Kevin Durant's shoes on his work, on his best day. That, you that's know, what I'm, that's that's what Hold on, wait, 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 wait. He can't sniff Kevin Durant's, you know, shoes. On his best day, as far as being able to shoot, he'll never be able to shoot like Kevin Durant ever. Okay, ever. That will never happen. What I'm saying is, he needs to be able to at least hit 35, maybe 40 percent of his jump shots. He can't even do that, and that's why I said offensively, he's limited. That's why I don't believe he's a top three player in the NBA right now. He he's is 36 percent. He's limited. Three. He's limited offensively. Yeah, maybe in the overall season. But in the playoffs, he, had, he didn't shoot well from the three-point range, Clarence. But here's the thing I want to say okay. this. I, when, it's, when it comes to who would I pair with Giannis, I wouldn't pair a 35-year-old Chris Paul with Giannis. I think Chris Paul is injury-prone. I love Chris Paul. This year, he didn't, he didn't get injured in the playoffs, thank God. But for the most part, a lot of times in the playoffs, Chris Paul gets injured. I wouldn't, I wouldn't pair him with Chris Paul because I don't think Chris Paul would be enough. I would pair Giannis with a two guard who can create their own shot off the dribble and who can hit perimeter shots. Like I actually think Harden would be a great fit with Giannis. Maybe even Bradley Beal. He needs like a two guard that can create their own shot. Who's actually better than Chris Middleton. You see what I'm saying? Harden's no, better than Chris I Middleton. Don't. Yes, he does. Harden is better than Chris Middleton. I'm Harden, not saying, look, listen to me. Hold on. Let's just, let me finish my point. I got you. Hard is better than Chris Middleton. So I think he needs a player that can create their own shot. He he's to me, he's more similar to like a Shaq than a, a, a Kawhi Leonard or a Michael Jordan or LeBron James. He's more similar to like a Shaq to me. So therefore, what does Shaq need to be successful? He needed his Kobe. Giannis needs a player who can get him in the right spots to be successful. And that needs to be a two guard. Maybe like a James Harden, even though James Harden's great ball dominant. Maybe like a like a like a Bradley Beal, you know. But they have to be better than Chris Middleton. Chris Middleton and Bradley Beal on the same level to me. James Harden's better than um, uh, James Harden's better James than Middleton. Middleton. But I'm just saying, I just think he needs that kind of player. But I, I get what you're saying, and James Harden, Giannis, probably that's the like least likely it's gonna ever happen. But I think for Chris Paul, he just showed us that. He can lead a team with with 
less hope. They had the lowest percentage of making the playoffs, though, Trey. I ain't gonna lie. I thought they were dumpster. It was over. I thought the season was over. I think they were gonna I thought they was gonna win about like 20 games. I'm gonna be real honest with you on Wednesday. I thought they was gonna win about 20 games. But I I believe that his play style and ability to keep the balance out a team is gonna be tremendous for them. And for Chris Middleton, he can actually play his natural position. His natural position is really a sh- like a shooting guard type. He he, he like work. He, he, he get his play style from Kobe. He's not Kobe, but he get his similar type of play style from him. If they get like a balanced point guard that can facilitate and score, that's balancing out the team. And they can play both sides of the ball. Oh, look, Milton is a good defender. And Chris Paul is a good defender. Giannis is a good defender. Okay, what else you missing? You managed to keep Lopez, and now you got an extra spot. You can throw in any type of style player you want. Now, I really think that Milwaukee Bucks should push for this trade because Eric Bledsoe, he's he's definitely his true position, a role player. I don't, I didn't really like him. I used to complain about how he made first team defense last year, but that was an argument for another day. But the point is that Giannis, he might be, he might do need his Michael Jordan, someone that can balance out the team so he can play his true position because the way that he attacks the game is very dominant and is very. It's tremendous. Even on the defensive side, he impacts on the defensive side. But how dominant are you if you can't be efficient when it matters the most? The he hasn't been efficient when it matters the most, okay. and that's in the playoffs. Hold on now, hold on. You keep saying he's so dominant and he needs his Jordan. That means he's not the kind of player you think he is. He's good, but he's not great. He'll win you some MVPs in a regular season. Can he win you a championship as a number one option? I say no, but here's another player I got for you who I would pair up with Giannis. He's only 23 years of age. Devin Booker. I think Devin Booker is the kind of player who can create his own shot, who can help set Giannis up in the paint to be able to be effective. I think Devin Booker is another player who can help Giannis be effective. I don't think Chris Paul at 35 will be able to help Giannis get to the NBA Finals and win a championship. I just think Chris Paul won't be enough. I think you need a scoring threat who can put the ball in the bucket and also facilitate for Giannis to be effective in the low post, in the paint area. That's just what I feel like. And I think now, that book gives you that. Now, now, book gives you that. Now, let me ask you this, though. So me and this guy, man, uh, man, this good, man, this good guy, Tyree, we was talking on social media today. Shout out to Bishop, Bishop Johan. So I was, we was thinking this. Imagine that Giannis teamed up with Devin Booker and New York Knicks. What would you think of that pair? In New York. In New York, in Madison Square Garden. There's no way in hell it will happen. There's no way in hell it will happen. You just, because you don't like the Knicks organization. Huh? No, because the, the Knicks are dysfunctional. Giannis and Devin Booker not going to the Knicks. That's not going to happen. But it was just I a think, But I think, I believe they will be a nice duo together. I think they will play very well together. And I think they could possibly win a championship because I think Devin Booker could be a number one option on a championship contender. I believe it. Devin Booker is a great player. Yes. He That's a high player. expectation. High, what you Did you say. not see Devin Booker in the seeding games leading the Phoenix Suns to an 8-0 record? They almost he got into the playoffs. The playoffs career. They almost got into the playoffs because of Devin Booker alone, Clarence. Come on now. But let's go to the second part of this question. How impressed – have you been with Jimmy Butler? To be honest, I've been impressed with Jimmy Butler. He's been amazing. Like, I ain't going to lie. And we know Jimmy Butler was, is a type of guy. He's a he's a guy that he, he lives up to the competition. He's a hard worker. He wants to win. He wants everybody to win around him. And believe it or not, they did win around him. Like, Jay, like I meant, honor to Jay Crowder was knocking down shots and playing defense. That's a good two-way player. Duncan Robinson shooting the threes. Goran Dragic was amazing in this series. Like, he was one of the top leaders scoring on Eric Bledsoe, whatever, shooting three. Bam out of bio, you know, he, he made second team on the defensive team. He was he was wonderful. He's a stretch five. And Jimmy Butler, he just manipulated all their styles and, and played, he played with it. Like, in yeah. moments, he, didn't, he, only, he only put up 40 points, what, first game, game one. And every other game, he just yeah. balanced it out like 15 to like 20 points because he let everybody else like play their style around him. And he, he, he just manipulated it. Like, big shout out to them. 
And I ain't gonna lie, I did throw trash. Yeah. I said that's a dark horse team. Miami Heat, that's a dark horse team. Somebody really gotta watch out for them. Now, if Boston closed out Toronto tonight, as they should, because we both had them in six, that series right there, that's gonna make might yeah. be a hard decision to think about. But I think Jimmy Butler did wonderful trade, right, man. I swear. He did. He did. he did. And you 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 hit on it. He, I was very impressed with how Jimmy Butler picked his spots in games, when to be aggressive and when to pass the basketball. He did a great job throughout this five-game series of knowing when to look for his shot and when to get his teammates involved. He did a hell of a job doing that. And also, Jimmy Butler, he's a very unselfish player. He's very unselfish, and he fits perfectly with the Miami Heat organization. Like, this is a perfect marriage. Pat Riley, Eric Spoelstra, and Jimmy Butler, he fits with that culture perfectly. I've never seen anything like it. He made the right decision to leave the Philadelphia 76ers in that mess with Joe and B and Ben Simmons and go to South Beach. Plus, ain't nothing wrong with going to South Beach. He went to South Beach and teamed up with Eric Spoelstra and Pat Riley, a championship organization, and now he has the Miami Heat in a position where they are one series win away from the NBA Finals. And real quick, I want to say this too about Jimmy Butler. He's been a hard worker all his life, and he never took any shortcuts, Clarence. He grew up fatherless, homeless at 13, because his mother says he didn't like his looks. He was the 73rd ranked shooting guard in Texas. He had no D1 offers, went to a JUCO school. Had to, <laughs> he had to fax Marquette a letter from a McDonald's. He didn't have any offers. And now he, was, now he is a five-time All-Star, two-time All-NBA player. Four-time All Defensive Player, he was a first-round pick. He, he got hundred forty million dollar contract. Man, I can't say enough about Jimmy Butler. He's one of the most underrated players we have in the NBA, and I want to give him a big shout out tonight on Wise Guys because he he is a story that you look to for motivation. When you're looking for some motivation, go look and read up Jimmy Butler's story. Yeah, I ain't gonna lie. Like you always say, man. The Milwaukee Bucks, they about to get some hard. They, they ain't sleeping tonight, man. They definitely not about to sleep tonight. Real quick, last question. Can the Miami Heat make an NBA Finals run? Ooh. See, you know, that's a tricky question, though, because, because if if Boston closed out Toronto tonight, you want to you, – you'd be so excited for the matchup for who, in this type – in that series, though. Because you'd be like, oh, man, Boston, man, we know – they was one. They was one game away going to the finals when they about to beat LeBron James. And then you got this Miami team. They just believing it, like believing they can win it. And Jimmy Butler is leading this way. And believe it or not, they got the better depth than the Boston Celtics. So it, it, it get very interesting though. Like it get very it very interesting because they they're a balanced out team because they got young players and depth and a superstar that can lead, that's leading them. I think they can make a title run. Yes, I think they can make a title run if they play, if they play and believe in each other. Yes, I, I believe they can make a title run as well. We got to see who they end up matching up against in the Eastern right. Conference Finals. But they are eight and one in the playoffs this year. They've been the best team so far in these playoffs. Let's give credit where it's due. We've been talking about championship contenders and the Lakers and the Clippers. We got to show some love to the Miami Heat. And listen, look, look at Game Five. The Miami Heat bench outscored the Milwaukee Bucks bench 38 to 19. Their star player, Jimmy Butler, only took six shots. <laughs> he went four of six and 18 points. Dragic <laughs> had 17 points. Crowder had 16 points. Olenek had 12 points. Bale, 13 points. Tyler Hero, 14 points. This team is a well balanced scoring machine. They have different players on their team who can put the ball in the bucket, Clarence. It's very impressive. And it's it, because if your star player only has to shoot six shots, it shows you how balanced your team is overall. So shout out to the Miami Heat. He just took a little day off, man. <laughs> he just took a day off, though. Hey, 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 do we got time, man? We go to the part two of the NBA? Yeah, go to the Lakers. We, we, we can talk about the Lakers. Let's talk about the Lakers. The Lakers beat the Rockets 112 to 102 in game three of their Western Conference series. The Lakers now lead the series two games to one. LBJ had 36 points, seven rebounds, five assists. Rajon Rondo contributed 21 points, nine assists. 
for the Rockets, Harden dropped 33. Russell Westbrook bounced back with a 30-point performance. So my question for you, Clarence, is what's your biggest takeaway from the game and the series overall? But, but hold on. Remember what I told you, though, that Rondo was going to contribute to this game, to this team because – and because he's veteran leadership. Remember what I told you they was loaded with veterans? Look what I'm telling you, Dre. They have someone that's coming off the bench as Rondo scoring. He don't, you don't need him to drop. You don't expect him to drop like 20 every once in a while, but if you give me at least 15, 12 to 15 points, that's going to that's gonna be well for me. And second of all, I can't forget about this. LeBron James just went crazy in the first half. 20 and a half points in the first half. He was just dominant. Like, like I ain't going to lie. Nobody on that Rocket team couldn't go stop him, LeBron James. He was shooting threes and – to me, I'm like, that's this is playoff LeBron. When you play LeBron in playoffs, this is what you're gonna get from LeBron. And I ain't gonna lie, people saying this is the Western Conference, it ain't like the Eastern. Man, forget all that talk. When you play playoff LeBron, you feeling it. And the Houston Rockets, they are definitely feeling playoff LeBron as we speak right now because he just phenomenal. Man, I can't I can't forget about Anthony Davis, how he's a stretch four and he's he scored at will and He's been dominating. He has 15 boards down there. And I, I expect him at least to get 15 boards because they, he has the advantage to them. Who's sticking on? Robert Covington, P.J. Tucker. I, that, that, that can't happen all game. Sometimes they're going to be switching up. But for A.D., he did a wonderful job, and he, they play phenomenal. I think the Lakers, they know they're in the driver's seat right now. Yeah, my biggest takeaway from this series and game three is the fourth quarter scoring being the difference and which team wins and loses. Because so far, whichever team wins the fourth quarter, they win the game in this series. In game one, the Rockets outscored the Lakers 27 to 18. In game two, the Lakers outscored the Rockets 27 to 17. In game three last night, the Lakers outscored the Rockets 30 to 20. So the fourth quarter scoring and execution offensively has been the difference so far in this Rockets in this Rockets Lakers series, in this Rockets Lakers series, the Lakers have not entered the fourth quarter leading yet in this series. That it hasn't happened, and so that's been the biggest difference for me. But last night, first half, it was all about LeBron James. Yeah, I agree, man. It was all about LeBron James, and LeBron James showed why he is the best player in the world, and he showed, you know, why he still to me is really the best player on the planet and in the world because he had it going. He, he had it going in the first half. Um, he had 29 points in the first half. He was shooting the three-point shot. He was getting to the rim at, you know, at will. He, he, he did his thing, Clarence. But, um, yeah, he did his thing overall. Yeah, and, and you know, you know, and another thing, too, like, I want to get to this Rockets team, too, like, James Harden, James Harden in this, in this playoff series, he's been playing well. He's actually been shooting the ball. He has been shooting the ball very well. And Russell Westbrook, he's coming to himself. And this game, he shot, he shot very well. He had 30 points, eight, eight rebounds, six assists. So he was playing like himself. And what I think for this team is that they just you you, you gotta you gotta keep putting up another a lot of points to win a win against this team. Because this Lakers team, they 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 have two of the top top players on their team, like in LeBron James and Anthony Davis. You have to find ways to beat their beat them, find the advantage. And I don't think and I don't think they're not finding the advantage. And James Harden, he has to be aggressive every game. Every game in this series, he has to be aggressive. You about to be now. You you looking at three one tomorrow? You you don't want to go down three one. I mean, the Denver Nuggets just came back from the Utah Jazz, but they had a chance. You you guys wouldn't really would. But I think that James Harden needs to play aggressive. Russell Westbrook, he has to take smart shots, and they have to actually use the small ball advantage. Yeah, and like I said, when it comes to LeBron James, overall clearance, offensively, he had it going because he took whatever the defense gave him. If they sagged off, forced him to hit perimeter shots, guess what? He hit perimeter shots in the first half. If they had a small little defender on him, and somebody he could post up, he got to the rim and finished in the paint. And also, even on the fast breaks, he still was catching alley-oops like he's 25. I'm like, damn, is this guy 35 or is he 25? Which, how old is this dude? This guy <laughs> is still a Skywalker 
and he still can lead a team to a championship. And in my opinion, he showed why he's still the best player in the NBA. And defensively, he had a block party last night on the Houston Rockets. He had four big-time blocks in the third quarter. He did great. I'm like, oh, man, if LeBron defensively is active, the rest of the NBA is in trouble. The Lakers will win a championship if LeBron is going to be locked in defensively because you can't do anything about it. Like the last play of the third quarter. I don't know if you've seen this play. The last play of the third quarter. I think it was Austin Rivers. Austin Rivers, he's trying to get a layup. Oh, yeah. Before the cover <laughs> beer, and LeBron comes up behind him and just swats it off the backboard. And I'm like, man, he had no chance. But overall, in the second half, Rajon Rondo did a hell of a job because he turned back into playoff Rondo. Playoff Rondo, he had 21 points, and he had nine assists, and he dictated the tempo of the game. He got the other players on the Lakers going in their offensive rhythm. He got Kuzma going. He got Caruso going. He got Morris going. That's what Rondo does for this Lakers team. He also spelled LeBron because he took some of that responsibility of handing the ball off of him. Therefore, LeBron could get some rest in the second half. LeBron only has seven points in the second half, but that's all he needed. But Rajon Rondo did a hell of a job spelling LeBron James from all of his ball handling responsibilities. So overall, I, I can't say enough about the performance that Rajon Rondo had last night. He shot three or five from three-point range, so he hit 60% of his three-point shots. And again, he dictated the entire tempo in the second half for the Lakers. We talk about consistent third scoring options for the Lakers. Whether it be Kuzma, whether it be KCP some nights, Denny Green, playoff Rondo showed up last night and showed why he could be considered a reliable third option for the Lakers moving forward because he had some big time shots. And people, and believe it or not, people hasn't been mentioning Denny Green. He's been showing not well in this series. He need to pick up the place because in this point in time, if he can't if he can't shoot the ball in. You, you, you better start Rondo somewhat because he, Rondo, he's going, he's playing. He's a big veteran in this, in this series, yeah. man. And one more thing I want to say. I want to give Frank Vogel a lot of credit because he has recognized he can't play JaVale McGee and Dwight Howard a lot of minutes in this series because they, ah. can't, guard, they can't guard the perimeter. If you notice, Frank Vogel is going small. They go ah. small and they put Anthony Davis at the five. I think that's a great coaching adjustment by Frank Vogel. I got to give him some credit clearance. That's a great coaching adjustment that he's made in this series. So my question, let's move on. And my next question for you is, who is going to win game four? Like you said, man, uh, big shout out to Frank Vogel. Who in, um, he, he realized the small ball that that um, the Houston Rockets is, is, is doing so. And that AD at the five is very dominant. So I got the L.A. Lakers. I got the L.A. Lakers winning, man. Me too. I got the Lakers winning game four. They'll take a commanding 3-1 lead over the Houston Rockets, and it'll it, it will, they're going to force the Rockets into an elimination game in game five. But let's move on, and let's get to our NFL segment of the day. We have our NFL kickoff tomorrow night, 8-20 on ABC? Not ABC. What is it? What is it? A, uh, NBC. NBC. It's going to be on NBC, NBC tomorrow night. NBC, NBC. NBC. We got We got – the Houston Texans and the Kansas City Chiefs, the reigning Super Bowl champions, tomorrow night. So let's break down these divisions, Clarence. And oh. let's start off. Let's start off in the AFC East. Last year, the New England Patriots won the AFC East with a 12 and 4 record. Buffalo Bills was 10 and 6. Jets was 7 and 9. Miami Dolphins 5 and 11. What are your expectations for each team in this division? Let's go. First of all, I'm, I'm gonna keep it real short and simple. And I, I, I want to, cause I'm so excited for the NFL tomorrow, man. Now we about to talk football back, baby. That's what we gonna do. But I think for the expectations of the Patriots, it's Cam Newton moment. Can he lead this team and keep the winning winning culture alive in New England? Because believe it or not, people thought that when Brady leaves, the Patriots is gonna be horrible. But can can Cam Newton lead this team to the NFC? And my th- my expectations for the Buffalo Bills. Josh Allen, you have a number one option. You have a number one option in the NFL, like one of the top receivers since Stephon did. It's time for you to show up. It's time to live your moment, man. For the Jets, <sighs> I try to be smooth, though, because they, they traded Jamal Adams, and that was controversial. I'm like, wow, y'all swapped them out quick. 
I think and this is Darnold moment too. Like, if you a quarterback that can play in this NFL, you need to show. You need to come in this NFL and show and show it. Like, this is their moment to probably actually surprise a couple teams because they have, they have a nice setup. But we have time will tell. And the last one, Dolphins. Now I say them for last because you did say that Tua Tagovailoa is going to have a better career than Joe Burrow. You yes, I did. Said that. Now, I did. Now, uh, old man Fitzmagic, Ryan Fitzpatrick, won the starting job for Miami. So he's going to be starting against the Patriots this Sunday. Yeah. Now, for him, I think that's still the best decision because you don't know you want to, you want to like, you know, you want to mold Tua in. But I think they're in position that uh, um, I think, you know, build now and win later. They in that type of situation. But that's my expectation for the uh, AFC East, though. Okay. Let me start out with the Miami Dolphins. Where you ended at. I think the Miami Dolphins are heading in the right direction with Brian Flores as their head coach. They signed Byron Jones and Kyle Van Noy in free agency. Also yeah. brought in Shaq Lawson. So I like the additions they made on the defensive side of the ball. Offensively, they traded for Matt Breida and they signed Eric Flowers on the beef up that offensive line. I like Tua. I like them drafting Tua. I think Tua is going to have a better career than Joe Burrow, like you said earlier. Um, I think Tua is going to learn that offense and get some more experience as the season go along. I think we're going to see Tua start maybe like week 10 or 11 once the Miami Dolphins are out of the playoff picture. But again, I like Brian Flores as a head coach. And the Miami Dolphins, though, their schedule is going to be tough the first four weeks. The first month of their schedule, they are going to be playing three different playoff teams. So that first month is going to be hard for the Miami Dolphins. That's why I don't think they're going to make the playoffs. But I do think they're going to have a decent season. Now let's get to the Buffalo Bills. Last year, the Buffalo Bills, they went 10-6. and six, And I like what I saw from Josh Allen. He had 20 touchdowns, nine interceptions, completed 59% of his passes. I thought yeah. last year he did a great job going through his progression, going through his mechanics. And I thought he improved last year as a quarterback. I still think he needs to relax in the pocket and not get so flustered. If you remember last year in the playoff game against Deshaun Watson and the Texans, Josh Allen was flustered in that playoff game clearance. He was all over the place. And I need him to be a little bit more calm in the pocket so the Buffalo Bills can have some success offensively. I like the fact that they brought in Stephon Diggs from Minnesota. They paired him up with Josh Allen. So I think that's going to help Josh Allen having a reliable receiver in Stephon Diggs. They also re-signed to Davius White, one of the best cornerbacks we have in the NFL. And they brought in Josh Norman and EJ Gaines to help him, help him in the secondary. They pass rush also should be improved. They signed Mario Addison uh, in free agency. They brought, they drafted AJ Epinesa. So I think they're going to do a great job defensively like they did last year and hold teams, you know, under 20 points per game. And if you can do that, you have a chance to win many football games. I also like Sean McDermott as a head coach. Um, I think he's one of the most underrated coaches we have in the NFL. I think the Buffalo Bills are going to have a nice season and they'll be competing for a playoff spot, you know, in the, in the AFC. Now, when it gets to the New England Patriots, I believe the New England Patriots, bringing in Cam Newton, they're going to be at the top of the AFC East. I like the signing of Cam Newton, and I believe that the New England Patriots should be the favorites in the AFC East because they have Bill Belichick. But Belichick is the greatest coach we have in NFL history. Make no mistake about it. Now him being teamed up with Cam Newton, and there are reports out of New England clearance that everyone has positive things to say about Cam Newton. Everyone. They're all saying positive things about him. So I think Cam Newton is going to rejuvenate his career and I think he's going to prove to all those doubters out there he deserves to not only be a legitimate starter in the NFL, he's a quarterback that can lead his team to the playoffs. I don't like the fact that the Patriots have eight players who opted out. Dante Hightower, Patrick Chung on that defensive side of the ball. I don't like that those players opted out. But I still think the Patriots should be the favorites in the AFC East. The biggest question for them is going to be, can they overcome all of the players that opted out? Can they overcome those losses? 
We'll see if they can. And the New York Jets, they're being led by Adam Gates. Don't even get me started with them. So I'm not even going to waste the time talking about the Jets. I know you saved it for last, man. You saved it for last. So, so who, who, who wins the AFC East? Man, look, I've been saying this all year. The Buffalo Bills win in the AFC East because they're the most balanced team in the AFC East on both sides of the ball. And I believe in the coach like Sean McDermott because he brings a, a nice foundation to Buffalo. And, you know, Buffalo, they, they, they have some loyalty fans. They love they even, When Stephon Diggs got there, they made him, they, they even named a burger after him. A burger. like, And it, yes. and it shows you the love of the Bills, man. I think it's going to be a tight race throughout the entire season. I think once we get to December, I think the Patriots are going to separate themselves from the Bills. I think the Patriots will win the AFC East with a record of like 10-6, and six, and the Bills will finish at like 9-7. and seven. I think the Bills have a shot at a wild card spot, but I think I'm going to give the Patriots the edge over the Bills because I believe in Cam Newton and Bill Belichick over Josh Allen and Sean McDermott. So I'm going to give a slight edge to the New England Patriots, but it's going to be a battle between the Patriots and the Bills. I think the Dolphins finished third in the AFC East. I think the Jets finished last. It's going to be a very interesting one, interesting one. But for Buffalo, this would be their first AFC East title since 1995. I'm expecting them to bring it home, bring it, bring it to Buffalo, man. Let's go. Let's go down to the South. Let's talk about the AFC South. Last year, the AFC South was led by the Houston Texans. With the ten and six record, the Tennessee Titans went nine and seven, Colts seven and nine, Jags seven and ten. What's your expectations for each team in this division? To me, this division is kind of tricky though because you got you got like three t- different type, three different play styles of teams in this division. Like, well, you got two. Well, believe it or not, the Titans and the um the Titans and the Colts they they got a similar type of style, but. Titans have the overall, in my opinion, because they, they have the better vertical threat on their team. But for this Houston team, Deshaun Watson, you just got paid. It's time for you to show up and lead this team. Lead this team to victory and show that you can play in this league. Now, it's going to be, I, I think this is going to be a bumpy road for him because at the, at the time, looking at his schedule, I think it's going to be time that he has to show. Even tomorrow, he has to show tomorrow. On, tomorrow on NBC against the Kansas City Chiefs that he he should be the best quarterback in this league. Now I'm gonna go I'm gonna go to Jackson I'm gonna go to Jacksonville real quick. Now they just dumped everybody off their team. I, I, it's a whole big list that we don't want to name. So they'll I, I expect rebuild out of them and they and I, I and I think they they're gonna be picking at the number one pick. I'm gonna just say it right then and there. He can, I'm gonna just get that out the way. Now yes. the, the Colts. I believe the Colts can make a playoff run because they have a oh, a, a, Hall of, a future Hall of Fame quarterback in Phillip Rivers, uh, one of the best offensive lines in the NFL, and a good run game. I think they utilize that more in Phillip Rivers, and he still can show he can throw the, the ball in this game. That that can be a, that can be a huge strain and a big upgrade for them. But their receiving core kind of scared me. Now I want to lead this to the Tennessee Titans because you know why. Big Derrick Henry and elite quarterback Ryan Tannehill. I think these two guys right here, though, Trey, they go lead the top, they go lead this team to in the playoffs. They signed you, they clown me. That right there is a big upgrade on their defense right there. And I think they can actually make a big, they can actually make a Super Bowl push if they keep it all together, man. Okay, so let's start off with the Texans. They just locked up Deshaun Watson on a four-year. $156 million new extension. So that was a great move by Houston, locking in their future, even their franchise quarterback. And Deshaun Watson is well-deserved. I've been on record saying that I believe if Patrick Mahomes wasn't in Kansas City and he was in Houston, and if Deshaun Watson wasn't in Houston and he was in Kansas City, I think Deshaun Watson would have a Super Bowl championship on his resume and a Super Bowl MVP. I think he would have similar accomplishments as Patrick Mahomes. I believe in Deshaun Watson. He's been a winner since he's been playing football and since he's been in the NFL for sure. I have no questions about Deshaun Watson's leadership. My question is about Bill O'Brien as a general manager because you trade away one of the best receivers we have in the NFL 
a reliable target for Deshaun Watson, you traded away DeAndre Hopkins for David Johnson? He just got paid, too. David, uh. John- David Johnson is injury prone. He can't stay healthy. Like, what are you doing, Bill O'Brien? I don't have any questions about Bill O'Brien as a head coach. I have questions about him as a general manager, Clarence. And that's one of the issues that I have with the Texans organization. What are y'all doing letting Bill O'Brien lead this organization as a general manager? It makes no sense. These moves that he's made has made no sense. They brought in Randall Cobb in free agency. Randall Cobb, I love Randall Cobb. You know, I, I loved him as a Packer. He was a reliable target for Aaron Rodgers. But Randall Cobb is not, is not to be confused with elite. Like, he, he, he's, he's not, you know, he's not on that level. So, yeah. I just think <laughs> overall, like, I like the Houston Texans. Um, I like what, the, the, you know, them as a team. But I just think they got questions because of Bill O'Brien. And, you know, that's, that's, what, I, that's what I got. When it comes to the Titans, um, I, like, I like Derrick Henry. You know, Derrick Henry is balling out. Hold on, Clarence. Hold on. Yeah, like what you were saying about Randall Cobb, I think that's a high, high price, low risk. I mean, high, high risk. I think you you pay him almost nine million dollars a year, and that right there made a decision. Like, can he even stay healthy, though, Trey? That right there was a question in the move about um, what, who, why did you sign this guy? You have plenty of receivers that's probably still out there in the free agency, but. The scheme you're running, you want they want to run as fast as they can. They want to they want to be a deep vertical team. Yeah, I'm having I'm having some things going on, bro. Uh, outside of the show right now, I got to handle. But I want to say this about the Titans. I I don't believe in Ryan Tannehill like you do. They signed him to a new contract in the off season, but I got my questions about Ryan Tannehill leading a team. I I like Derrick Henry. I think Derrick Henry is a top seven or eight running back in the NFL and he did great leading them to the AFC championship. But um I just I just got questions about Ryan Tannehill overall, you know, as a as a quarterback being able to lead this lead this team. Um Definitely. I think I think defensively they got better bringing in Jadavion Clowney. They just recently signed Clowney so bring him in free in the free agency is going to help them on defense. I like the Titans. I do. I think they're well coached by Mike Vrabel. And I was impressed with that run they made last year in the AFC playoffs. But I still got my questions about Ryan Tannehill. I don't believe in Ryan Tannehill like you do. And I think they could have saved some money if they brought in Andy Dalton or even Nick Foles over Ryan Tannehill. I don't think Ryan Tannehill is, I don't think Ryan Tannehill is significantly better than Andy Dalton or Nick Foles, if at all. If at all. But nah, he's definitely better than them two guys you just stated right there. I don't I disagree with you. I disagree with you. That's another conversation for another day. Now, when it comes to the Colts, I, I got my questions about the Colts because I'm not so sure if Phillip Rivers is, you know, if he's still got much left in the tank. He had 23 touchdowns last year, 20 interceptions. He was a turnover machine last year for the Chargers. I'm not sure he got anything left in the tank, Clarence. I like the offensive line. They got one of the best offensive lines in the NFL. I just don't believe in Phillip Rivers anymore. I think Phillip Rivers' best days are behind him, and I think he's going to struggle in this division with these other teams that play elite defense, like the Texans, like the Titans. You know what I mean? I just just got my questions about Phillip Rivers. But, you know, defensively, I think the coach got some pieces where they can make some noise. I like Frank Wright as a head coach. You know, we're going to see what he do this year with that team, but – I, I got my questions about for the Rivers and the Jacksonville Jaguars. What, what's, what's there to talk about? They're clearly in rebuilding mode. Yeah. And they are trying to tank for Trevor Lawrence. That's what they're trying to do. It's obvious. And believe it or not, for that Jacksonville Jaguar, I like Gordon Minshew. The Minshew mania, it was, was, it was fun. It was fun when it would last. And he actually had the most wins by a rookie quarterback last season. So I think – if he, if they, if they're picking number one, they better pick some receiver cores around them, part, you know, skill players around. Them. They better. He, this is here to show that he's their future quarterback. Who you got winning the AFC South? Believe it or not, I got the Tennessee Titans coming out the AFC South, man. I think with Derrick Henry running the football and 
they adding Jadavian Clowney. Like, that's dangerous, though. They're, they're, then they're young, and I think Derrick Henry, he, he's dominant. He's a dominant runner that you can't tackle by yourself. I got the Tennessee Titans. I've been going back and forth between the Titans and the Texans. I'm going to give the slight edge to the Texans because I believe in Deshaun Watson. I believe in Deshaun Watson, Clarence. I really, really do. I don't believe in Bill O'Brien in that organization, but I like Bill O'Brien as a head coach. I don't think he's a bad head coach. And I think Deshaun Watson is going to carry the Houston Texans to the top of the AFC South. I think the Texans are going to win the AFC South with a record of like 10 and 6, like they had last year. They'll be like 9 and 7 or 10 and 6. And I think the Titans are going to be right behind them in that division. I think it's going to be a tight race, just like the AFC East. I think it's going to come down to the last two or three games of the season. But I'm going to take Deshaun Watson over Ryan Tannehill every day of the week and twice on Sundays. So I believe in Deshaun Watson. I got the Texans winning the AFC South in a close race. Let's move on to the AFC West. The Chiefs won a division last year with a 12 and 4 record. Broncos went seven and nine. Raiders went seven and nine. Chargers went five and eleven. Give me your expectations for each team in this division. Not that much expectation for this division, to be honest, because this division is like, who is the second team that's going to show up? Who's the second best team in this division? Like, we already know what we're going to get from Patrick Mahomes. We know what they're going to bring to the table. We're, we know what they're about. They're dominant. And you want to see who can step up and beat the, beat this Chiefs team in this division for this year. Remember, when Mahomes was starting, the Chargers defeated him with Phillip Rivers. And they, they came in swinging. For this Raiders team, they just revamped their whole defense and they, they added some weapons for the draft and signings. So I obviously had the Oakland Raiders like up there. But for the Broncos, unfortunately, they just lost Von Miller for the year with an ankle injury on the last day of practice. I think right here is it's, I think their defense is gonna hurt a lot, but their offense is very Bright. The offense is very bright, and they got a great future behind them, though. But for the Chiefs, they go keep rolling, man. They're they go keep rolling. We I don't have no no expectation for them. Um, play defense, I guess. That's how I'm feeling like for them. And another thing for the Chiefs, though, I, I do want to say for the Chiefs, can you can your rush defense the rush defense get better? Because you did sign Chris Jones, you know, and he's a good run stuffer and pass rusher. Can they can they stop the run? Can they stop the run? Their offense is dominant. We expected from that trade. So we know what, how, how the offense will be. Their main goal is can they stop? Can they have a good run defense? Hey everybody, y'all watching Wise Guys on the World Wide Sports Radio. Remember, everybody follow us on Wise Guys on Instagram. These guys on sports, even Facebook at Wise Guys and Twitter, Wise Guys underscore OH. And definitely, y'all give us a subscribe to Wise Guys on our YouTube channel. These guys know sports, and we are here live on the World Wide Sports Radio Network. As my, as you see, my uh, partner Trey Larkins is having difficulties with his network. Oh, he's back. Right. The mute. The mute. On mute. Tomorrow we gonna go. We gonna go live tomorrow, Clarence. Me and you, and we are gonna talk some more NFL and give our predictions on the um, AFC and NFC and who gonna get to the Super Bowl. We got all that. Let, let, let's let's try to make that happen tomorrow. You know. Yeah, I, yeah, I want to talk some more NFL with our for our fans for sure. Everybody, remember go and follow Wise Guys on Twitter at Wise Guys underscore H. Also on Facebook, Wise Guys, and make sure to follow Wise Guys on Instagram at These Guys No Sports. And real quick, Clemson, before we get out of here, live score update. The Raptors are leading the Celtics 98 to 94 with about three minutes left in the game six game matchup between <laughs> right now. So we're going to see what happens in these final three minutes. We might have those two words that every sports fan loves in sports, and that's game seven. Oh, man. Game seven. Oh, I'm about to tune in right now. Everybody have a great night. It is the Worldwide Sports Radio Network.